You know, the interesting thing about COVID, every week, ask me the same question, I'll give you a different answer. In the next several days to a week or so, we're going to continue to see things go up. It's really hard at the beginning, I think, to, just to realize how contagious this, uh, this virus really was. There are many things about this virus that we don't understand. Do you know what even is more contagious than the coronavirus? the fear. And you know what it really occurred to me? Why? Why we're so afraid of the coronavirus? It's because it's invisible. We have no idea where it is. We have no idea who it has attached itself to. I remember sitting in that isolated room and praying to God, please help me through this so I can return to my family. I didn't know if I was going to make it out, and I didn't know if I had done everything I wanted to do. Every time something went away, something else came up. This is not a financial situation. It's not a social situation. It's not anything other than a war and a fight for our lives. And what you need to do, people, is you need to come out on the other side. And then we will figure out what is going on. It was called a bad flu. Twelve weeks later, we know it's a lot more than that. So, you know, a lot of people ask me where I got COVID from, if I know. I say I got it from New York. <laughs> so it began just living, living and breathing along with 8.5 million people. It flipped for us early December that something was going on in Wuhan, China. We began to realize that, like most epidemics, they don't tend to be confined. This virus is spreading very quickly because, as the name says, it's a novel coronavirus, so none of us have immunity. At first, I wasn't ill. I just was tired, very fatigued. Two weeks after that, I now knew that I had the COVID virus. For me, in my instance, I personally did not think I would get COVID ever. I didn't think I had COVID because in my mind, if I had COVID, I would be immediately dead. Just by saying words, I'd be dead. The highest fatality rate is for those aged 80 and over. I woke up and had the scariest symptoms of my life, which was just tightness in my chest and heaviness. For me, it felt as if someone were sitting, someone heavy were sitting on my chest and they were covering my mouth with a wet rag that was hot. And I really couldn't get a good breath unless I was on all fours, I quickly discovered. I had never felt pain in my chest or back. I was always like, that's something that old people will feel at some point of their lives, but I'm not old. But it was terrible. This really hurts. It's like nothing I've ever had before. I wouldn't wish it on my enemy. I could not get out of bed. I couldn't walk four feet to a bathroom without oxygen and help. The universe wants to kill you. It wants to take all the life out of your lungs. When Karen started getting sick, she was just not doing well at all. This was deteriorating, you know, right before our eyes. She said, just take me to the hospital. And I knew at that point, I said, well, this is, this is the beginning of the end. And in the middle of this, um, the family that she lived with started freaking and they said, we adore this girl, but we can't have this in our house right now. So in between all this, we also had to move a very sick person. They basically stopped me at the door and said I was not allowed to go in because of the isolation issues. And I had to leave her there. I, <clears throat> and I had no idea what to do, what to say. Having the doctor walk in, goggles, face mask, face shield, two gowns, you realize that's to protect her from you. I, I really was frightened. I did not want her going to the hospital. At that time, the hospitals were insane. I was terrified that if she went there in her weakened state, that we would lose her. 
And that's a phone call to her mother in Colombia I was not willing to make. As sick as I was, I'll never forget this. Do you want to be intubated? And I remember thinking, why are they asking me? I'm so ill, just do what you need to do. But I did open my eyes and say yes. I knew it was my only chance for survival. It was, it was a struggle, it was a lot of worry, uh, a lot of anxiety going on here in the household because you know, we didn't know whether she was ever coming back here. People think that it's just gonna be the elderly or it's just gonna be people with pre-existing conditions. I know a lot of people who are young and healthy that have succumbed to this disease. You know, I'm, I'm 33 years old, I'm, I'm a runner, no history of asthma, no pre-existing conditions, and it just, it just really hit me hard. I remember I would tell Marion's son every night that he would keep me company, man, I'm gonna die. I'm not gonna see my mom anymore, I'm gonna die. I, I can't describe the fear the absolute terror of going to bed every night and saying, please don't die, please don't die, please don't die. All of my middle aged patients, you know, they're healthy. They never saw their vulnerability. And boy, they were introduced to it. The mortality, they got introduced to it in a really hard way. It was really a scary experience. And the worst part is that you have to go through that alone. To be isolated and alone with no physical contact and know that there's not someone in another room when you yell help, that somehow you're going to have to get yourself to a piece of equipment. You're either physically isolated or emotionally isolated and told you can't be around people you love for weeks on end. This wasn't a five-day flu. For many patients, I would say 14 days was the typical course, where people were basically like prisoners, open, either opening a door and shoving food under the door, um, and they were isolated. So there's a tremendous anxiety component that we've been identifying with these patients. She died alone. We didn't even get to say bye to her. We couldn't even give her like that boost of morale to say, hey, you know, you're gonna come out of this. Or we need you to come out of this. Like, there was nothing. When you go through an experience like that, you come out saying, I'm so grateful for life. How can I be the best person I can be? And the way that I can do that is by going back to work and helping the other people. When you go through something like this yourself firsthand, it really does change your perspective. It just, it makes you notice that there's so much you take for granted. Hopefully it makes me kinder, not just to myself, but to others. And I would say you can survive it. You can, and you should keep that attitude until something happens that you can survive. Just the empathy of knowing how sick you can get and how important it is that as we talk about reopening the country, we also take a real moment as a nation to pause and give respect and mourn those we've lost and those who are still suffering. We hear these numbers and we hear these statistics and unless it's affected you personally, I don't think it registers to people that these are individual human lives that we're talking about. To the world, you may be one person, but to one person, you may be the world. This is the most gut-wrenching pain I've ever felt in my life. I have three co-workers that have died that I know of. If there's one thing that I can say that my mom would have taught me or told me now would be value your parents, value the time you have with people because you just never know when they're going to be taken away from you. You know, cherish those moments, the, those happy moments and that's how I want to remember my mom. And this is where I want to say the health care providers are amazing. They were there for me. The nurses, the nurses aides. I have a ton of friends who are EMTs. They are sleeping in their cars outside of the station because they don't want to potentially risk their families. 
these frontline people who have put their lives on the line to support you under the most adverse conditions, but they're doing the best they can all the time. You know, doctors and nurses are known for their ingenuity, but right now they're facing unprecedented pressure and a crush of patients. And it feels like there's nothing we can do for her. No matter what, I still love my job, and I'm going to do everything in my power to save lives. Take some deep breaths. You're okay. Healthcare workers have come down and gone home with these stories and have to live and remember them. My best friend was a fireman who died in the World Trade Center. And if you said to him, oh, you're a hero, he would say, nah, I'm just doing my job. And that in itself is what makes you guys so heroic. Because you don't do it for the credit or the fame or the adulation of the crowd. You do it because it comes from the heart. The level of sacrifice is just staggering. I don't know how we can ever repay that. We have a lot of heroes. The first part of the pandemic was the fear of getting it. The middle of the pandemic was surviving it. And now it's like, oh my God, what did I just go through? You know, the question is about people who are now home, they're recovering, what's the path forward? And I would begin with cautious optimism. Depending upon the person, the recovery from COVID is going to be like a tale of a million different cities. We're finding that some patients, they just go on their merry way. But for some other patients, COVID's gonna carry a multidisciplinary health burden with it that's going to require medical care, nursing care, psychosocial care, because this is very emotionally traumatic. I can tell you, I'm looking at some 12 week CAT scans that radiographically do not look like they're gonna come back. Some of these x-rays look like fibrotic, scarred lungs, and these lungs are not coming back. And that's gonna be a whole new generation. So that story has to be told. Here in New York, I'm thinking about what can we do to not just harden infrastructure in our hospitals, but also what are you gonna do for the patients who, like Gabby and myself, have moderate COVID courses, which can frankly turn far deadlier very quickly. It's really not enough to say to Americans, just stay home. You should be telling them, get an oximeter, check your oxygen. Is there a community health center where they can go just down the street to make sure they're monitored? Well, I will tell you, everybody I talked to on the phone who I know had COVID, we didn't get them tested. At the height of the epidemic, nobody got tested. So getting antibody testing on a population like New York City, we talk about herd immunity. Well, we haven't tested the herd. The herd may be 10% of me, the herd may be 30 or 40% of me. Here in New York, not only do we have high numbers in general, but just knowing that Black and Hispanic communities have been hit the hardest, really thinking about how to protect them. One way, for example, I really think is to get more PPE to essential workers, not just medical. So thinking about the next wave, hopefully it doesn't come, but in case it does, we need to make sure that it's janitors, porters, not just doctors and nurses. So now we're unraveling the processes we put in during the crisis, and at the same time, building new processes to take care of a whole new host of patients. It's going to be modeled almost after the World Trade Center. You know, we had a singular event when the World Trade Center was bombed, and then there was 20 years of health implications that followed we have is going to be more important than ever. There are still thousands of people dying from COVID every day. 
We're seeing numbers rise as states continue to ease restrictions. And as states and locations start to reopen and say to you, yeah, it's safe, go back to work. You have to ask yourself, what are the motives? Why are these people telling me it's safe when for months they told me it's unsafe? Are there reasons political? Are there reasons financial? Are there reasons power related? Trust yourself. If something doesn't sound right, if your gut is telling you something's wrong, it probably is. People have this idea like it's over, but keep in mind that we have done nothing to kill the virus. Yet. Coronavirus has a much longer attention span than human. So coronavirus isn't getting tired of this. COVID-19 is waiting to see what's next. So for those of you that don't think this is real, I hope you never find out from personal experience just how real it is. I just want people to be safe. That's all. And until there's a vaccination, we won't be truly safe. We expect to see more cases. We expect to see more hospitalizations and we expect to see more deaths, unfortunately. But how do we prevent a complete relapse? How do we prevent a complete separate wave? From what I see, it's gonna be very difficult, but there are things you can do to make sure that you optimize your chances. There's something called universal precautions and universal precautions have to do with the idea that we assume that everybody is a potential carrier. We don't look at somebody and say, they look healthy. We don't look at somebody and say, they have big muscles. We take universal precautions, meaning we wear a mask, we protect our eyes, we protect our face, we protect our hands, we wash our hands frequently. We avoid big crowds, we avoid close contact. And these things make a big difference. So I want to state very clearly that these precautionary measures will only take us so far. Without really asking ourselves, what did we do? What did we do to contribute to all of this? I can assure you this is not going to be the last pandemic we face. I want to share a piece with you it hits the nail on the head and I think puts a lot of things in great perspective for us. We fell asleep in one world and woke up in another. Suddenly Disney is out of its magic. Paris is no longer romantic. And New York doesn't stand up anymore. The Chinese wall is no longer a fortress and Mecca is empty. Hugs and kisses suddenly become weapons. And not visiting parents and friends becomes an act of love. Suddenly you realize that power, beauty, and money are worthless and cannot give you the oxygen you're fighting for. The world continues its life and it is beautiful. It only puts humans in cages. I think it's sending us a message. You are not necessary. The air, earth, water, and sky are fine without you. When you come back, remember that you are my guests, not my masters. I ask you all to remember that the earth and all of its inhabitants were here long before us. Animals, forests, oceans have all been here long before us, living in a harmonious balance for millions of years. Most 
if not all infectious diseases, are what we call zoonotic. That means that they start in animals and jump to humans. We can socially distance, lower stress, and exercise all we want. But as long as we force animals to live in the exact opposite condition, we are not safe. As long as we chop down our great forests, pollute our oceans with filth, and continue to force species out of their native habitat, we are not safe. Humans, we must give up this insane notion that the Earth was put here to be our personal smorgasbord that we can take, 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 take. Guess what? The Earth is giving us plenty of signals. How much louder does it need to speak? As we rise from the ashes of this pandemic, I have only one hope in my heart for humanity. My hope is that we can put all of our differences aside, because when you think about it, our differences pale in comparison to our similarities. We all cry when a family member dies. We all strive to live by each other's happiness, by each other's misery. My hope would be that we can look beyond borders, beyond the color of our skin, political or religious allegiances, that we can once and for all come together. That once and for all we can learn from this. My hope is that we can come away from this smarter, stronger, and better for future generations. And the way that we do that we opt to follow the science, we opt to follow human kindness, and we opt to fulfill our role as stewards of this planet and every living being on it. Today is June 22nd, 2020. Nearly 500,000 people have lost their lives to COVID. Let us honor this loss and let us honor their lives in the way that we live our lives from this day forward.